Sounds great. Okay. Very good. Okay, take it away, Dan. Okay, so I'm happy to tell you this morning a little bit about the status and the, the plans and the motivation uh, behind S Phoenix. And honestly, the, so this is a picture that I'll explain more later. It's of the inner H pal being inserted into the magnet uh, last in June, I believe. Um, and it's tempting to just show you pictures of the, the pretty impressive construction that's going on out of the hall. Uh, and the pictures I have in the slide are actually already outdated from ones that I got this morning, but uh, I'm gonna start at the beginning and tell you why we're just so excited about doing this. And so as Peter said, please uh, stop me at any point for questions. Um, okay. So uh, our motivation is actually very well stated in the, the 2015 long range plan, which is the, the most recent one uh, that has been written. And, and we're part of uh, two, one of two pieces of the, really the central goals for completing the scientific mission of RIC. And this is really to probe the inner workings of the quark gluon plasma on shorter and shorter length scales uh, to using hard probes. So this is complementary to a lot of the physics that goes on in the LHC, and it's certainly uh, very much in line with the, the physics interests of the Jetscape collaboration as well. Uh, and in order to do this, we need a state-of-the-art detector. And so that's what we're busy constructing now. Uh, it's called s -Phoenix. Okay, so there, there's the, the, the big picture motivation. Uh, the program itself, if you wanna think more in terms of observables, really focuses on hard probes. And so jets are a big part of what we do. So the structure of jets, the rates, the correlations, all of this, we wanna understand that. Uh, we wanna make precision measurements of quarkonium, specifically the upsilon states, which you can see here. And we wanna vary the, we wanna understand the, the parton uh, and mass um, differences in, in energy loss. So we're talking about photons, we're talking about heavy quarks uh, and light quarks. We also have a program in cold QCD, and I'm going to not discuss that here. I'm going to focus on the three parts that are heavy ions, but it's worth noting uh, we have a transverse spin run in the, the second year. Um, so, and cold nuclear matter effects in, in PA runs. So there's a lot of very exciting things you can do with the detector like this uh, in terms of cold QCD as well. Okay, so this is a, a focused program. I mean, Rick has obviously been running uh, for over 20 years now. And there's a, a huge number of measurements that already exist at uh, 200 GV. So the S Phoenix program is really focused on these things that we can add substantially to what has been measured over the, the last two decades. Uh, so the state of the art detector. So this really has a bunch of ingredients that have not existed in one detector at RIC before. Uh, so e either with, with Phoenix or STAR. So first of all, to combine them into a single detector, we have a, a large uniform acceptance. Uh, it's built around a solenoid uh, with one and a half Tesla field that, that was formerly in the bar. Uh, we have full electromagnetic and hydronic calorimetry. And hydronic calorimetry had, and rapidity had not been um, present in either of the RIC detectors, but this is really essential for harvesting the, the full rate of jets. Uh, high precision tracking and vertexing. So this is essential for our, our heavy flavor program um, and for the Upsilon program, really being able to, to measure what's going on inside those. And, and also for jet substructure measurements, as we'll talk about a little later. And then uh, really huge gold gold data samples uh, without any biased uh, triggering. So we do have jet triggers at very high PT, but they're going to be fully efficient and we're going to have a huge sample of minimum bias uh, gold gold events. And so that means where we just trigger on that there was a hydronic interaction. So this is really, it's an optimized for hard probes detector and it's, it's unique uh, among RIC experiments. Uh, the other thing, the detector is great, but you can't do anything with the detector unless you have a collider that's capable of delivering your beam. And if you want huge data samples, you're really interested in the luminosity. And the, these are the current RIC projections. And RIC is a, a detector that's or a collider that's been around for a long time, but I just want to draw your attention to some of these numbers. Uh, so this was the, the luminosity in 2016. It's sort of a baseline for gold gold. 
And this is what's expected in 2023, and this is what's expected in 2025. And so I think the point you should take away is that there's really a huge increase in the RIC luminosity in the S Phoenix era over 2016. So not only do we have this detector, which is, is new, uh, but we also have this collider, which is improving. And so this is really another key aspect of being able to have huge uh, gold, gold data samples is having a collider that can deliver them. And so we're really looking forward to having a detector that can harvest the, this full rate. Okay. So why jets at RIC? I mean, there's a huge jet program at the LHC, there's jets at STAR. Uh, why, why focus on jets at RIC with a, a new detector? And I think I probably don't have to explain this to this audience. Um, it's probably been discussed a lot at the school. Uh, but first of all, obviously, there's a different QGP. We have lower temperatures or, or closer to the QGP transition. And so this is a nice plot from a hydro model that uh, Christopher Kuhnberg made me. And so you can just see the, the trajectory as a function of time on the x-axis of the average temperature, uh, both at RIC and the LHC. And you can see, I mean, they really are, are living in, in different uh, trajectories. And this temperature at the at RIC, you know, it's maxing out at something like the uh, maybe up to 300 uh, MeV, whereas, and so it's, it's living all this time in a much you know, cooler system uh, than the LHC is essentially. Uh, also, you get different jets. Um, and th this is clear, we get different flavor composition of the, just the inclusive jets uh, due to the lower collision energy at RIC. So uh, the range that you can measure jets at RIC, we have many more quark jets than gluon jets because they're at higher X. Uh, than is possible at the LHC, as you can see on the right plot. So we know from a lot of the measurements that are coming out of the LHC that quark and gluon effects seem to be important. And so this is another way to, to change that up and, and vary that in, in the jet measurements. Uh, also, there's different jet QTP interactions. So these lower energy jets are expected to spend more of their time, more of their evolution interacting at the QGP scales rather than the, the vacuum scales. And this is shown uh, schematically in this plot. The QGP scales are shown in blue with little waves, it's, it's liquid. Um, and so there's more of the trajectory is really probing the QGP at RIC than the LHC. So this is a, a, another way uh, that we're uh, differently sensitive at RIC than the LHC. And so this really gets at what it was in the long range plan quote, that this is a, a complementary program for the LHC, right? We're trying to understand the quark gluon plasma. And so it's not about the collider, it's about how you probe the material that you make. And so we can do that in a complementary way at RIC uh, to what's already being done at the LHC. So the, the run plan, um, is a three-year, uh, very focused run plan. Uh, and we put a lot of thought in the collaboration into this. It's been reviewed uh, for a number of years by the PAC uh, at Brookhaven, and, and they buy into this. And so the first year is 2023. Uh, so that's actually really close. It starts in early 2023 in February, actually, uh, with commissioning and first gold gold physics data. And so you know we're in the process of putting the detector together now. And obviously it's a non-trivial task to turn it from a bunch of pieces of hardware into a functioning physics experiment. And so that's what we will uh, begin with BEAM uh, in February and the first gold gold physics. So as we're able to uh, commission the detector, we anticipate having a, if things go well, we will have a sizable data sample of gold gold uh, from the 2023 data. Uh, in 2024, uh, we have proton-proton data, and this really serves two purposes. Uh, first, for a precision reference for the heavy ion measurements that we have, uh, for RIA and, and all sorts of measurements, uh, but also to do transverse uh, spin measurements with the detector. There is also a PA run uh, for cold QCD and small systems measurements, which we're very excited about that fits also into the, the 2024 run. And there are also the protons would be transverse polarized. And then in 2025 is where we really take uh, a huge amount of luminosity for gold gold running. And so the idea is that we would record um, over 140 minimum bias gold gold collisions in the uh, 28 week running scenario that's shown here. And so if you want the details uh, of what's the justification for this, what the commissioning plan looks like, you can take a look at this document. This is the BMUS proposal. And 
all of the projections that I'm going to show for SPNX measurements as, as we go forward are, are from this document. So if you have questions, you can certainly ask me, uh, anybody in SPNX, but you can also get the, the full story in this uh, document that you can find in the link here at the bottom. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start out with JETS. This is the Jetscape collaboration. I'm excited about JETS. Um, and what we have here is the projections on the left for RAA. So this is using the full data sample that comes from the, the run plan that I showed you on the previous slide. And so uh, what you see in red is probably the most dramatic thing, is that we would have RAA measurements out the past 60 GEV. Uh, these are the statistical uncertainties, and we've just picked a level to put these uh, particular uh, RAA values at. Uh, but with the data that we uh, would get with our run plan, we would have RA measurements every guide to pass 60 GB. And so this gives a couple of uh, important things. First of all, this is a, a large portion of the kinematic range that's available at RIC, right? Uh, you can only go up to 100 GB, uh, and we, we would have counts past 60. Um, the other thing that is important is that uh, this starts to map onto the region. Uh, where you can measure jets at the LHC as well. So you can measure jets at both RIC and the LHC in the same kinematics. Uh, the same kinds of projections for charged hadrons are shown here in black. And so you can see that because that's obviously the lower PT, but you know, we have a, the ability to measure a lot of hadrons. And also very excitingly is direct photons going out past 30 GeV. Uh, these are of course are over error probe. And so what you see here in the table is just the, the raw number of counts. And uh, again, for the same three-year run plan, I mean, this is crazy, 22 million jets above uh, 20 GeV. There's a lot of things you can do with it. RAA is just the, the beginning. Then I'm going to show you projections for looking at correlations uh, with photons. You can imagine doing things about the jet structure. Uh, this is just a huge sample of jets. And so what I'm going to show you in all these projections is things that uh, we know we want to measure, and I think one of the things we're interested in hearing from uh, the theory community in general and, and people who are thinking about jets and uh, jetscape is, you know, what else should we be measuring with these, these huge data samples? So that's something that I think there's a lot of thought to be done. Um, and so the direct photons, we've got 2,400 of those past 30 GeV and central gold, gold collisions. You see there's slightly lower numbers than proton, proton collisions. Uh, but still enough to do a precision measurement. Uh, so this is what we get for the three uh, the three year run plan uh, with these huge data samples. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, photon jet measurements. I, I don't think I really have to motivate that that much. Uh, photon jet balance is obviously a key energy loss measurement. It's uh, uh, been termed a golden channel uh, many many times. Here's a, a nice plot from Atlas that I just picked because because it was handy. Uh, so this is the photon jet balance. So the, the jet momentum over the, the photon momentum at the LHC and central lead collisions in red and in proton-proton collisions in blue, you can see it's peaked uh, in proton-proton collisions and then there's this die off here. Whereas in red, the entire distribution seems to really be pushed off to the left and due to jet cantering. And you can see these photons, they start at 63 GeV. It's uh, harder to measure photons at the LHC. We can go to lower momentum for the photons at RIC. We have to because of the statistics, but we also, we can because the measurement is, is straightforward. We have a calorimeter, which is very well designed to do this. Pies are suppressed. So here's what we expect to be able to do um, in SPHOENIX. This is based on Joule here, uh, the, the gold gold. Uh, and you see in red, so we would be able to measure jets down to measure a large fraction of this distribution. Uh, the proton proton uh, is peaked here in black. And what you see is that this that does seem to be pretty narrowly peaked, more so than what we saw at the LHC. Uh, so SPNIX will be able to make precise measurements of the data, not just the, the models, uh, with lower momentum photons and jets in the LHC. And so this is something that we're excited about doing. Uh, another thing that is very relevant that uh, it's been discussed in a lot of places I've been this summer, and I'm sure other people as well, is the radius dependence of jet suppression. Um, so one thing that's nice about going to RIC is that the underlying event is smaller uh, because it's a, a much lower collision energy. And this helps if you want to measure broader jets at a lower PT. And I know Star has done work on this as well. Um, 
and what's particularly interesting right now is that there's LHC measurements which currently disagree. Uh, so what's shown here on the right is the uh, radius, the ratio of jets uh, at different radii to r equals 0.2 jets as a function of jet momentum. And the, the preliminary ELISE results are shown here in sort of purple. And the, the published ATLAS results are shown here in green. And you can see they're, they're, very, they're quite different than each other. Um, this is a region where S Phoenix would be able to actually have quite a bit of precision because of the, the large number of jets in looking at uh, what's going on with the radius dependence of jet suppression. And so this connects back to the physics. You can think about how the, the QGP is responding. You can think about how the suppression might be different for different jet structures. Uh, but this is a region where there's current disagreement at the LHC where S Phoenix would be able to make a precision measurement. Uh, jet substructure, I'm sure, has also been discussed a lot here. And uh, this is just a nice plot from Elise showing theta and G, the different distributions in lead-lead and proton-proton collisions. Uh, and you see the distribution is being shifted in proton-proton collisions, or lead-lead collisions as opposed to proton-proton collisions. Uh, and I mean, this is, you know, entire conferences have been devoted to jet substructure measurements and heavy ion collisions. So this is really just a proxy for all the interesting things people are doing for, to understand jet substructure. And we know that this is important uh, because we've seen substructure dependent quenching uh, at the LHC. Uh, there's been measurements at STAR as well. And as Phoenix, because of the full calorimetry and the excellent tracking with very large data samples, we'll be able to do a lot uh, to really uh, measure this at RIC. So what I've shown here is just a projection for ZG. And I think the important thing you take away from this is that there's essentially no statistical uncertainties in this. Uh, this is for 40 GV jets. We have, a, we have a huge amount of them expected. And so we would be able to, to measure this, we'd be able to measure uh, a wide variety of substructure measurements that you know, people are interested in. And so I would not take this to be constraining, but only, only an example of the kinds of things we'd be able to do. Actually, Anne, I'm going to... Uh, one thing that I'm particularly Anne, interested in... Yeah. Anne, I'm going to take Chairman's privilege, do what a chairman never to do. I'm going to ask a question. Can you go it. back to the R, R dependence? And I think it's yeah. it's relevant for the schools. So that's why I, I'm going to do this. So the right plot. Very good. I like the way you represent this in the right panel. I noticed that... At, and now you can ask you to put your Atlas hat on as well. <clears throat> the Atlas is RCP, not RA. In other words, normalized by peripheral. And uh, we've seen from other studies that you know, peripheral um, nuclear collisions is not the same as proton-proton collisions. So the normalizations of ALIS and ATLAS are different. What is your kind of you know, professional opinion about the difference that makes? And it also you know, gives you a chance to riff on the importance of proton-proton reference. So I would certainly say that that is a caveat for the ATLAS measurement. They're also at different collision energies. This is the 2.76 TV uh, result from ATLAS. It's actually a, quite an old paper uh, that I believe is Aaron's thesis analysis. Um, and so that's another difference between the ATLAS result and the ALICE result. The ALICE result is also charged jets where the ATLAS result is calorimeter jets. So I would say there's a number of differences here. Um, I would say that your point about the proton-proton uh, -proton collisions being very important is, is essential. I mean, we've seen that using peripheral as a reference is, is not optimal, and that's why the proton-proton running is so important to S Phoenix, uh, both to get a high precision measurement, but also not to have to have any of these sorts of questions about what's going on. We know that there's a lot of things that we are working to understand in small systems based on what we've learned over the last decade in PA collisions. And so I just, I don't think I can emphasize enough the importance of having a, a real proton-proton reference um, to use as the baseline for an RAA. Okay, thanks. I note on your left on your left plot, uh, you do include the proton luminosity. So these error bars include both together. That's kind of yes. a twist, but uh, thank you. No problem. Thanks for the great question.
Uh, so B jets are, are, are another important thing. This is a nice measurement uh, that came out of Atlas re recently, which is the ratio on the left here of the B jet RAA compared to the inclusive jet RAA um, and compared to a couple of models. And so what you see is that we see some deviation. We see about a 20% a difference in the B jet RAA compared to the inclusive jet RAA. Um, and so some of these are expected from flavor effects at the LHC because of uh, these higher energies, the mass becomes less important because the momenta are very um, large compared to the mass in PT, but also because it's uh, relatively straightforward to make B jets, is in jets which contain a B hadron, but it comes from a gluon which splits, splits into a B bar pair. So that's obviously different. Uh, at S Phoenix, when you're looking at jets that are at much lower momentum, both the mass is more important uh, because the PT is lower, but also this gluon splitting is, is a much smaller effect. And so this might be a really great way to really measure the, isolate the mass effects. And so this is the uh, projection from S Phoenix to the BJET RAA. Uh, and you can see there's an estimate of the efficiencies for tagging these and the purity of the samples that we would get. And that goes into these projections. Um, Everyone who's done B tagging knows it can be a, a difficult task, um, but assuming we can get these kinds of efficiency securities, we'll be able to make these measurements with the, the data samples that we have. And that's really exciting uh, to really get a new physics. And going from jets, well, obviously we can uh, measure heavy flavor hadrons as well. Uh, one thing that is great about this is, uh, I didn't mention it before, it's uh, the PP, we have a streaming readout, so we can increase the amount of uh, untriggered PP events we get in the tracker. And this is really what makes these RAAs, which are not part of the jet or something that's easily triggered on in the calorimeter, that's really what makes these possible. And so you see uh, B mesons, you see B to Ds, and prompt these here uh, going out to 10 GeV. The statistics are, are really good. I mean, the plot just stops at 10 GeV. Um, well, also, and, and five minutes. Okay. Um, also, what a measurement that blows my mind that we can that has been made. Uh, there's a star point here, but we would also be able to make an S Phoenix as well as the lambda C to D ratio, uh, and a way to get a hadronization measurement. So this is also very uh, important, and these again are just representatives of the kinds of measurements you can make. Uh, another measurement that I think S Phoenix will be have, have a huge impact in is the upsilon. So these are the, the three upsilon states shown here on the uh, right. Uh, these are uh, the projections as a function of n part for uh, RAA. And you can see the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s. Obviously, we haven't made these measurements yet. The, the measurements are actually pegged to a theory calculation, except for the, the 3S, which is raised up a little bit higher based on the recent CMS result that's shown over here. Uh, what's interesting is after we made this plot star recently, I think even just last month, uh, published their Upsilon RAA, where they see something pretty different than what is seen at the LHC. They see that the 1S and the 2S are, are pretty close together uh, for most of the centrality range. And so this is very interesting. There might be very different behavior at, at RIC and the LHC. Uh, the statistical uncertainties are, are large. And so I think having the star or having the S Phoenix measurements uh, with the precision that we pro uh, project here is going to be key to really sorting out if there's something fundamentally different going on at RIC and the LHC. Uh, so I'm pretty interested in that as well. Um, and I, I don't want to uh, neglect PA physics. Uh, I think everyone knows at least uh, that over the last decade, PA physics has provided a huge number of surprises uh, in this field and understanding how jets and hard probes fit into uh, what we've been learning from flow measurements and PA collisions is uh, a key question in my mind uh, that has to be worked out. And so one highlight that I've chosen here, but out of many, uh, is the V2. I think that this is certainly something that, that I've discussed with a lot of people, uh, among them Peter at, at high PT. Um, this is something where the LHC measurements seem to be uh, challenging what we're seeing in the RA measurements. And so really having uh, precision measurements at S Phoenix would be a, a key thing to have. So this is the projections for V2 of uh, D, prompt D zeros, uh, jets and hadrons from S Phoenix. 
but of course we would have these huge samples and we would be able to, to make all sorts of other measurements as well. Okay, so there's a lot to discuss and I'm just giving you a you know, 25 minute talk about what you know, the collaboration has made projections for. Uh, there's also a lot of great talks that are available at this workshop that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, there were two great Jetscape talks there from Amit and, and Raymond, so thanks a lot for uh, participating in that. Um, people who were able to attend the workshop in person, you can see them here, they're getting a tour of S Phoenix. Um, so that was great as well. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture that had both the participants and S Phoenix Excel in it, so I left it off. Uh, but I would encourage you guys to all just take a look at these uh, talks. There was a lot of interesting talks uh, from the theory community, but also from S Phoenix uh, working group conveners and others overviewing the S Phoenix capabilities in more detail than I was able to discuss here. I haven't discussed the, the details of the detector at all, uh, but there's a lot more in these talks. So I will show some pictures because they're they're great. So as I mentioned, this is the inner HCAL uh, being inserted. And here the outer HCAL is uh, this thing behind the, the dots. That's the outer HCAL, uh, which is the thicker one of them. And then if you look at the silvery thing that the green arrow is pointing to, that's actually the solenoid, which is, used to be a very prominent feature and now it's quickly getting lost. Uh, and this is them putting the inner HCAL, which was constructed uh, on the AGS floor at an, uh, building 911 at Brookhaven, uh, into the magnet. And inside the solenoid, or inside the inner HCAL, goes the EMCAL. And just last this week, uh, the first two EMCAL sectors were installed here. Uh, so this is uh, 132nd in, no, yeah, it's a, it's a wedge in, uh, by and it goes uh, plus minus 1.1 in rapidity. Uh, and the, these are two sectors. You see the break in the sector in the middle there. Uh, that's at 8 equals zero. And actually, about 20 minutes ago, no, an hour ago now, I got another plot that it's not two sectors that are installed. Now there's eight sectors installed. Uh, so that is progressing rapidly and is very exciting to see. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, so just in summary, the SP physics program is really essential to the completion of the RIC scientific mission. Uh, we have a targeted three-year program to take advantage of this new detector uh, that is on the focus on hard probes physics and rests on the excellent performance of RIC. Um, so the Brookhaven PAC recently released their report, and you can find this as well. Uh, it says the top overall priority in planning for the coming three years is to commission the SP detector and achieve its scientific program. And so the collaboration is really committed to making this happen. Uh, the installation is in full swing. Uh, and the collaboration is, is on track to begin commissioning with BEAM uh, in February 2023. And, and we're really excited to work with the entire community to uh, improve our understanding of what's going on inside the QGP. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Anne. Uh, questions? Just, I guess uh, raise your hand like we do on Zoom. and. I will recognize you. So while people are, are thinking of questions, I don't see any at the moment. Uh, let me ask you one more. And this is about your luminosity projections. And I answer a question I asked Gunter at a meeting we were both at, you know, it was a while ago. This um, yeah, go to your your table, the table even there we go. Yeah, nope. Uh that this one. one? No, the yeah. one you present to the pack. Um previous slide. There we go. So um, these are certainly large numbers, um, but there is additional luminosity not recording. I'll, I have some in, you know, inside knowledge that you you have to, like every experiment, you have to select your vertices. Um, and as I understand it, these are selected to be in the sweet spot of your heavy flavor tracker, yeah. which, uh, and there's a lot of luminosity outside of that. So that's just the way it goes. But my question to you, and I got the country's view a couple of months ago, and I want to get your view as well. Um, for some of your main probes, like photons and jets, you don't necessarily need the heavy flavor tracker and you could expand your, your, your uh, acceptance by a large fa a factor if, if you understand the material and can really, really do a high quality analysis. So I understand it's being looked at. What's the prospect to really increase these numbers by a large factor for a subset, but a key subset of observables like photons and jets, or in particular photons and jets? 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I'm not sure what Glunther said. Um, so one thing we, we have done is we're going to have a crossing angle to increase the fraction of collisions that really happen in, in the sweet spot, which is this plus or minus 10 centimeters. Um, another thing I think we have to see is, uh, it's one thing to Monte Carlo it, but it's another thing to, to see the effect of the material. I mean, if that degrades the measurements such that the material outside of the sweet spot, if you you know look at collisions with the vertex at say 20 centimeters off the, mm -hmm. the nominal interaction point. Um, and so I think we have to take a look at what that looks like for, for example, photons, which are one of the more the most statistics hungry of the right. kinds of measurements that you could do outside of the uh, the uh, this uh, window of plus or minus 10 centimeters. So, so I'd like to see how that looks before I, I make a comment on that. And that's not something that uh, I know of any real studies in that I can talk about right now. Okay. Questions uh, from the students? So I know it's at the uh, end of the summer school, and the, you know many of the people here are students. And I would say that you know I, I, I provided the you know the nice S Phoenix talk, but there's a huge number of students on S Phoenix as well as well that probably have a lot of creative ideas. I can probably answer some of the students' questions offline if they're having trouble thinking about them right now. So All you right. should definitely reach out to to anybody. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I think we'll, um, one more chance for questions and then we, we will move on. Uh, well, thanks, Anne. Uh, very, very uh, nice talk. Obviously more material than one can possibly hope to present in, you know, in a half an hour, but uh, certainly a very, very uh, a nice and incisive overview in the S Phoenix plan. And it's great to see all this beautiful hardware coming together and uh, soon real data. So uh, congratulations on all collaboration and, um, Best of luck to, to, to wrap it up nicely. All right, well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, uh, next talk is um, by Shuzhe Shi. Are you on?